Thank you. Um, this is not the setup that I expected, but we'll make do. Uh, my name is Nader Shatara. I'm the Vector Control Specialist for the Department of Public Health. And um, I'll tell you something. For the last 10 years that I've been the Vector Control Specialist, things have been really interesting. Um, I've had a plenty of opportunity to work with uh, a number of city agencies on uh, not just rodent problems in various areas, um, but other uh, problems as well, which I won't be getting into. But uh, one thing that I uh, noticed that when working with uh, other, uh, let's call them stakeholders, be they uh, city agencies, uh, contractors, property owners, uh, so on and so forth, uh, you get a lot of support and you also get a lot of resistance depending on what the situation is, uh, politically or otherwise. And um, a good example of that, uh, or the probably the best example of that, are the uh, plague outbreaks of the early 1900s here in San Francisco. Now how many of you know, actually how many of you didn't know that there are plague outbreaks around the turn of the century? Okay. Yes, there, there were. And uh, the, um, they believe that it came from uh, Honolulu, uh, Hawaii, where there were um, uh, plague outbreaks a few years earlier uh, on a ship called the SS Australia, which uh, came into San Francisco in January of the year um, 1900. And about three months later, um, we've seen the first uh, outbreak of, uh, or first case of plague uh, when that occurred. Um, so the, um, it, it, was, uh, it was rather interesting because uh, uh, there are a lot of entities here in San Francisco that did not want to hear that, mainly the business community. Plague is bad for business, okay? And uh, because um, it got a lot of people's attention, a lot of people's concern, um, the, uh, the business community um, got the support of the governor who outright denied that there is plague in, uh, in, in the city. <laughs> yes? So, so we're talking about the bubonic plague that ravaged Europe in the uh, yes. 12th, 13th century? Yes. We're talking about that same type of a disease occurring here in San Francisco, uh, which, uh, which came up uh, in, uh, mainly in Chinatown, uh, in the Chinatown area. It was pretty much confined to the Chinatown area uh, for the next uh, couple of years or so. Um, and it wasn't until the uh, real uh, until the election in 1902 that when the uh, governor uh, Gage got replaced with a new governor that was supportive uh, of the Department of Health here uh, or the entities uh, supporting um, you know the, the fight against the plague that things really started to happen and when they did happen we're talking about um, you know uh, just straight up front IPM principles uh, that early on, which is really great. Um, let's see, let's go to the next slide. Please. Thank you. Um, well, I also wanted to introduce the other panelists, uh, which were already introduced, but I'll reintroduce them. Uh, Nikki Mixon, of IPM coordinator of Department of Public Works, uh, who's been great support, as well as Matthew Pruitt, uh, SF Department of uh, Rec and Park. Uh, as well as uh, Luisa Gurta, the president of uh, PESTEC. And they'll be uh, doing their own sections uh, on this discussion. And, um, and I'll be chiming in on, uh, on their work as well, uh, you know, to give my perspective on it. Um, so uh, the, the other reason why I bring up the plague outbreak of the uh, early 1900s is when you review the health code that pertains to rodent control, it looks, it looks like it came right out of that, okay? Uh, if you can go to the next slide, oh, yeah, this is it, okay, no, no, back up, okay. Uh, so health code section 92 pertains to rodent control, and uh, well, uh, it starts out by talking about the authority of the director uh, or his designated uh, employees can basically go in and do inspections regarding rodent control uh, at any reasonable time. Um, so when the um, when the outbreak or when the first uh, case occurred in um, March of 1900, um, 
it was diagnosed as plague, but there is um, uh, a lot of opposition against that. Um, so the necessity for the Department of Public Health to have this uh, ability, uh, you know, it was really important. Um, all buildings uh, to be free of rodents, uh, that's a catch-all. Basically, we do not want rodents to be um, active in any building here in the city or any uh, area where, uh, where people have, uh, have access to. Uh, exclusion of rodents in buildings. Uh, one of the things that the, um, that the quarantine officer wanted to do was to, um, uh, to have funding to go into Chinatown and uh, address a lot of the um, buildings that had uh, dirt basements, basically where rats were burrowing and getting into the buildings. Uh, and once that funding was available, they went in and they uh, concreted the various areas, uh, sanitized, and uh, did a lot of uh, rodent exclusion. Any building that couldn't be excluded was destroyed, basically. Okay. Um, exclusion of rodents at, at docks, okay? Like I said, uh, it was thought that the rodents came in on a ship coming in from Hawaii, uh, and once they uh, um, crawled on the docking lines, and get into that area, we want to make sure that they don't get a foothold in any of the buildings or any of the structures uh, in the dock area. Um, marine vessels need to be shielded, uh, and I'll show that in the next slide when I get to it. And exclusion of slaughterhouses. I'll be talking more about the slaughterhouses and uh, their role in the early 1900s. Uh, dumping waste material prohibited. I'll be talking about that too with respect to the slaughterhouses and the early um, uh, uh, produce markets on Front Street. Okay. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, so to prevent rodents from uh, getting over into the dock, we have these barriers here that you have on the docking lines. Um, and you know, that's because of the importance of that. Uh, it became law uh, early on to prevent rodents from uh, coming onto shore or coming onto the docks. Uh, next slide. Okay. So uh, Butcher Town is at Islas Creek, and this is right after the 1906 earthquake. Um, now, if you look, the buildings are uh, set on a dock uh, and set in Islas Creek well away from the main areas of the city uh, because you can imagine, uh, you know, the people that would frequent the restaurants to get their nice steak or meat or whatever uh, really wouldn't want to see what goes on in these uh, slaughterhouses. Uh, and they're situated on the docks so that the, uh, the entrails and the waste and the body parts could be thrown into the water and washed out uh, as the tide goes out. And if, the tide, and if it's low tide, they'll accumulate. And uh, literally, um, uh, millions of rats would be out there feeding off of it, and during high tide, they'd literally be swimming in the water to uh, gain access to the, uh, to the food source. Uh, as quoted by uh, Langley Porter, the early doctor of the 1900s, um, and, uh, and, you know, when, um, after the 1906 earthquake, uh, the uh, outbreaks were not so much centered in Chinatown anymore, but all over the whole city. Now you can imagine after the earthquake, there's gonna be lots of uh, rubble uh, in various areas, uh, which provides harbage for rats. Um, there's gonna be homeless encampments spread all over the city, uh, such as uh, Dolores Park, Alta Plaza, uh, and various other areas where we uh, probably go to and uh, enjoy ourselves, you know, enjoying the parks here. Those were once homeless encampments in the uh, early 1900s, where there would be, um, accumulation of uh, food and waste, which would attract the rodents, um, as well as uh, um, uh, uh, warehouses that were, um, that were affected uh, during the earthquake and left abandoned with uh, food sources. Uh, so the, um, the occurrence of rats uh, increased in, uh, in all parts of the city, um, as well as the uh, plague uh, occurrences and the plague outbreaks. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, this is the Rattery at 401 Fillmore Street, uh, 1907. So uh, the, the rats would be taken to the Rattery and youth, um, uh, euthanized if they're not dead already 
and uh, checked for uh, fleas and also a uh, plague. Um, in addition to the um, to addressing the uh, the slaughterhouses along Islas Creek, um, the uh, the authorities went over to Front Street where there is uh, numerous um, uh, produce markets, uh, open air produce markets, where they just take their uh, produce and leftover waste and just dump it out into the street. And that was also uh, an area where there is high uh, rodent infestations. So um, so that actually that got cleaned up a lot faster than the uh, than the slaughterhouse uh, situation and, uh, and things started to look up. And by 1908, uh, the, uh, those outbreaks were, um, were uh, basically uh, non-existent. Uh, but soon after, there's another outbreak that was more associated with ground squirrels, which I will be talking about. Okay, so uh, next slide. Uh, let's see, Public Works uh, did some work on UN Plaza, so Nikki, all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning everybody, my name is Nikki Mixon, the IPM coordinator for Public Works, and one of our uh, road abatement projects this, this year was down in the UN <coughs> Plaza in the heart of San Francisco. I think, well, can we go to the next slide? So this is a, a aerial map of UN Plaza. Sorry, I'll it's okay. All right. So so this is what this is what UN Plaza looks like from an aerial view. And the areas that are circled over there on the other side, that's where we were having a lot of rodent issues this year. Next slide, please. So th this picture right here, this picture was taken in the daytime. So if you see rodents out in the daytime, of course you know you have a huge problem. And, and this and the picture on the uh, on the right, on the uh, left side is one of the the garbage cans that we have there as well. So as we know at, at UN Plaza, there are uh, farmers markets that happen there a couple times a week. There are also food trucks in the area as well, and there's also nonprofit organizations that do uh, feeding to the homeless population in the area. So just a combination of, of those of those three things. And then there's also a water fountain in the area as well that's on 24 hours a day. And then um, the Exploratorium put in this art exhibit. So this art exhibit was basically the icing on top of the, the, the icing on the cake and the rats uh, were able to burrow underneath it. So it caused a huge problem in the, in the area which was a public health concern. Thank you Natter for that. Uh, so, so what we did was our, our, first, our first level uh, of controls in the area is where we were doing some trapping, but due to the size of the population, trapping was not enough. We also did some sanitation measures and some educational outreach um, to the vendors in the area. And there's a, there's a, a, a group of, uh, it's a nonprofit organization, Hunters Point Families, that actually, um, has uh, oversight of the exhibits as well. So they were trying to help with the sanitation efforts. Next slide. So this is also one of the other locations that uh, Natter had helped me out with. This is uh, 20 UN Plaza, uh, 10 no, 10 UN Plaza. Plaza, where we were having uh, road issues um, in this area as well. Uh, we were, um, there are uh, roads entering and exiting through um, this corner of the building, uh, Natter helped me out with that area and had uh, cited the had cited the restaurant. Next, next slide. Thank you. We also had other sanitation uh, areas around the back side of, of UM Plaza as well. This dumpster, we have a, a, a team at Public Works called the One Team, where they go out and uh, hold people accountable to the public. Uh, public works codes that uh, residents in the city or businesses are supposed to abide by. And one of those, uh, one of those codes is actually how you store your, your trash and when, are, when you're able to put your trash bins out and bring them back in at a certain time of the day. You have a certain amount of hours to do that. Uh, we have 50 UN Plaza here. Um, 50 UN Plaza is actually part of the federal building. 
we had uh, rats living in the the um, the, ex the exposed uh, crack in 50 Ewan Plaza, and then that is the mechanical pump. Uh, that's debris in the mechanical pump that was um, underneath the fountain. Next slide, please, Chris. This is also on the fountain. We had a lot of debris in these areas as well, uh, gates. Uh, so I had um, our public works, um, our public works street and environmental service team go down inside the pumps, um, the gates inside the pumps and clean these areas out. So, I mean, this, this, the, the location had, had a, a lot of other issues that were neglected um, over time and things that homeless people um, continuously damaged in the area. And one was uh, taking the grates, taking the grates off of uh, some of our drains. So in this picture, you probably can't see it that well, but in the second one, there was, every time we went to the plaza, the water was sitting there and there was constantly fresh rodent uh, feces in the area there. And that's also the, the same crack just from another angle at 50 UN Plaza. And so we, we went through that whole process trying to do a lot of sanitation patrols, cleaning up the area, citing um, different, uh, citing different um, entities that we couldn't control. Uh, and so after we cited the entities, we did this. We also started uh, excavating the area. We, I mean, sorry, let me back up a little bit. We removed the plat. We had the exploratorium remove the platform, which was the which was the the heart of the issue. And then we started doing a burrow, direct burrow abatement with the giant gas destroyer, which is a smoke bomb. So that that worked pretty much immediately. I, I think we did it. I think it, it was probably about consistently for about three weeks we did that. And by the time uh, we finished um, using the giant destroyer, we didn't have any rats in the plaza at that point. But still, um, that wasn't enough because we took it to the, the next step, which what we did was we put down a layer of base rock and then we put in this geo mesh. It's called the, it's, it's a patent by a company. It's called the excluder. And it has uh, it has a stainless steel um, fibers inside of it, side of it, so the rats can't penetrate it. So we put that on top of uh, we put that on top of the base rock, and then the next slide, please. We put we put this uh, decomposed granite. The landscape team actually installed the decomposed granite on top. We're still we're still actually working on it, but at this point, we don't have any rats in in those sections of UN Plaza. And the strange, things it, strange thing is, is that if you go down to UN Plaza, the two um, art exhibits that are, uh, that are west of these two areas where we were having all our road issues, they were already done with the decomposed granite before the installation happened. But these two areas, for some reason, didn't get the decomposed granite in first before they did the installation, so I think the future for these areas, they're going to do an installation, but I'm going to make sure that whatever the installation is, is doesn't have a bridge, because that most definitely was the uh, the heart of the issue. <coughs> See, right? Was there baiting going on at the same time? Was there any baiting? Yeah. No, we didn't use any bait. Okay. We didn't use any bait. Okay. No. Did Pest Tech do any baiting in the area? Uh, I think we did one time. Okay. Only in the sewer system. Yeah. It's a manhole on the sewer. How about bar? Yeah. Bart. How about Bart Newton? <laughs> well, uh, not, not, not that I know of. Like I said in the beginning of the discussion, some entities work into it together, some don't. Yeah. Okay. And I just want to clarify yeah. uh, our role in this. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, in the public areas. DPW has jurisdiction, and on private property, it's DPA. That's why uh, when you went Plaza got referred to me, and I addressed that issue, or am still addressing that issue. So next yeah. slide. Thanks. So this is just a graph of, of how we how we installed it, just in case anybody was curious uh, of how we installed it, the soil, and then we have the base rock level. The, uh, the That type of geomesh, that was the first time our team ever used it. They, I think they did a, a fabulous job. 
uh, with installing that and then putting the decomposed granite on top. We're still working on adding more <coughs> decomposed granite and um, tamping it down. So, we'll have I mean, Is that like fabric with steel in it or does it look like metal? You want to talk about uh, it a little bit? Yeah, it looks like mesh. It's kind of like steel wool fibers in it. Okay. Yeah, kind of like Brillo. It's, oh, um, you can so you wear roll. it out like a fiberglass kind of thing? Yeah, yeah it, it comes in a roll. Yeah, you roll it out like regular roll fabric. Out. Like last day. How wide? Uh, it must be heavy. Yeah, not nah, really. It was pretty light. The, um, how wide was it? About six feet wide? Eight. Eight feet wide. Yeah. And you just roll it out and it comes with tampers, the pins, plastic and metal. And you just and tamp stainless it steel. Stainless steel. Right. And, so um, it's really cheap. Yeah, they cut it pretty easy. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I didn't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's always cheap when you're not paying. But yeah. but, uh, and how long is it? How long has that been down since? Oh, uh, maybe about a month ago. Yeah, about a month ago. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're still we're still working on the project. It's it's not it's not a hundred percent complete. Um, but as the project stands now, we don't have any uh, roads, even though there's this one rat that keeps trying yeah. to get in. <laughs> That's coming up there from the BART uh, station. But you know, <laughs> yes, it's the same rat, right? <laughs> the same rat. Yeah. So, any questions for me? Will that decompose, that, uh, that geo mat will, will decompose in time? No. No? No. Okay. And where the DG was installed before, did you see digging in it? No, no digging there. So even it could be without the geo clock, Correct. just the DG tamping Correct. could do it. Yeah, but I just wanted to be yeah. triple sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, now you have that. a good pilot, right? Yes. You have one way exactly. Yeah. exactly. So the, how, how big of an area doesn't have a geo mesh? Um, I didn't, I've been measuring it, but it's, 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 right? yeah, it's, like about, it's about two, two of those, the same, the same areas, but just behind it. So, yeah. Like about a third of the area. Fourth of the area or something. So one half. Half, 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 the half the area. area half the area. Oh, good. Yeah, you have a test. Right. Yes, we have a test pilot. Yes. Anything? Uh, right. Sean. So you don't plan on planting anything else in there? No. no, no, because there's a lot of uh, homeless, homeless traffic. People would just take the plants and pull them out. There's, there's no point in putting any plants in there. All right, that concludes. Well, I wanted to say at the beginning of all that, we had that big, really cold meeting out in the. Plaza, yeah. all those, uh, a bunch of departments Correct. represented, which was actually kind of unusual. We had uh, Mayor's Office of Homelessness, we had um, Hunters Point Families, we had Chris, we had uh, Natter, um, Natter's boss, uh, Larry was there, uh, my boss was there, and then the after, the, there. Yeah, after that meeting, we also had another meeting as well that had some of the same players, but then had, um, my big boss, uh, the DDO of um, Public Works, was also there because we were getting a lot of complaints about the area, mm -hmm. and you know, like I said before, that's that's one of the heartbeats of San Francisco, and it was very important for us to get that area under control and for people to actually enjoy it. Because I went down there at 12 o'clock on the afternoon, and someone was eating a burrito, and the rat was like 10 feet away. So I mean, it's just like, <laughs> so yeah, so. So yeah, it was very important for us to get that under control and as quick as possible. Can you can you talk about uh, what drove the idea of putting the exhibit there? Because there was a point to actually having that. Yes. Right? The the point of having the exhibit there was um, to actually attract. I'm gonna say the correct energy in the area instead of having all the drug use that was there, even though we had some having Hunters Point family there, which is a nonprofit organization and they give people in the community jobs. So that was also um, an addition to having an exhibit where we were able to employ people as well. Did that work? Did you see like you had a change in the-, the Yeah, oh no, there was a huge change. That's why I'm an advocate of them replacing um, that uh, the art exhibits that were there before with new art exhibits because I think that it was it was great for the area. And maybe some that are rodent proof or exclude oh, yeah. the rodents from getting under them. Yeah, I, I think we're going to be involved in the process of awesome. <laughs> whatever I'm they good. do next. I'm, I'm so. glad that was brought up because you see this time and time again, not with the, not just with exhibits like this, but with the parklets, with the various types of parklets right. in in the city that showed uh, the uh, rodent harborage. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have these exhibits or you can't have parklets. You can if you do it the right way with respect to rodent control, yes. okay? In fact, you can turn the whole thing into a, 
Well, I, I'm not going to say a giant bait box, Chris. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but at least a means of uh, trapping or, or um, accessing the area for, for maintenance. Yeah, and even how you just uh, recently uh, uh, sent me an email about the, the Ford uh, bicycle racks. Right, yes. Uh, rats are going under there as well, so. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. Oh, Wait, which species of rat? Oh, Norway. Norway. Yeah. How can we track this? How, how can we monitor track? how well it's working? Oh, um, how well what we did was working? How, 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 will, how will we monitor going forward to see if we're being successful? Oh, we're out there. We're out there all the time. So, so like, we, what yeah, we do? yeah, see we see them or not. Correct. Yeah, visual. And complaints probably, right? Yeah, I think more in visual uh, inspections instead of trying to be more proactive okay. in, in in the plaza instead of waiting for us to get a complaint. I'll be counting boroughs if they if there are any more boroughs. Right. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? That's fantastic. All right, thank you. picture here is uh, Willy Wu Wong. This is uh, an area where uh, our fence meets a private building um, and we teamed up with uh, public health and um, uh, public uh, works to get together and try to figure out solutions. That, um, so they were using this section here. You can see the dirt moved away. There was a bunch of burrows there and Luis helped us um, seal that as well. He sealed it with, I think, concrete, correct? Yeah. And, but he had treated those, uh, those burrows first. And then um, basically what we do is, um, you know, we're always uh, searching for signs and symptoms of, of rats. We do it on a monthly basis. We have developed routes. So we go and visit each location at least once a month. Um, so we search for ideal we search in ideal borough locations such as planter boxes. Um, we can see um, there's a burrow right by my foot there under a shrub. So we have to look under shrubs, um, near trash areas, bases of trees. They like to use structures like foundations of buildings to use so they burrow underneath. Um, we're also looking for droppings. Um, we're also looking for paw prints. Um, we also um, look for um, rub marks and other signs as well. If you go to the next slide, I'll show you some other burrows, examples. So there's another one there. It's kind of inconspicuous with the boulder and um, there was some uh, vegetation kind of blocking it. Um, and then uh, what, what we also do is when we come to a site, for example, Portsmouth Square, when I first started, there was um, 50 plus burrows in one planter bed and um, it's hard to tell what was new, what was old. And so we started abating by doing night trapping, heavy night trapping. Um, and we did an experiment with uh, uh, dry ice. And that, that, uh, that worked really well, but we were shut down as far as using dry ice. Um, but part of it was just crushing the burrows and seeing what came back. And as you can see, this last uh, picture here, uh, that's a fresh burrow. The dirt's freshly moved out, there's some debris, um, there's actually chewed up trash, um, <coughs> giving evidence that it's, uh, it's a rat <laughs> burrow. So, so we actually have this new machine, it's a CO machine. Um, it's a gassing machine that we're able to use now. And that has really made the difference because we did use the gasser bombs, which worked really well. Um, but, um, but this machine's a little bit easier to use and we can get to more places, we cover more area. So we're, we're monitoring these areas where we do treatments, we're counting burrows, we're 
crushing burrows, and then we're coming back to see um, what if, if there's you know new evidence. Um, we're also implementing night trapping still. Um, With uh, what night trapping? So what do you, what trap do you use? So generally, we use the old Victor the wooden traps. They work really well, and we blanket in an area of 80 to 100 traps uh, after the park is closed down. So at night we can come return. Sometimes we get as many as 50 plus rats. Sometimes a couple rats. Sometimes none. So um, that is a good indication whether you have an issue or not. And even when you're out there, you can see them running around. We did try some experiments. We did an experiment at 24th North. We did some sealing on one side. Uh, with some uh, stainless steel mesh. Uh, and that stopped them. They did try to keep continuing to burrow, um, but it's in a really small park and there's buildings next door, so they're drilling through the, the wood and the fencing and other materials. And then the other side, they're still coming through. And it's difficult for us to kind of exclude that area, so we have to continue to do night trapping there. Um, but going forward, we're working with our capital division <laughs> as far as when we develop new plans and, and prevention and, and figuring out ways where we can exclude, if we do have a plan or bed where we can implement these techniques um, using the mesh or um, um, making sure that the garbage area is secure, putting in garbages that are animal proof. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Um, that's pretty much it. Any, any questions as far as what, what our role is? Um, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Why were you stopped from using uh, CO2? It was uh, it was a dry ice. Dry ice. Um, well, there's someone someone else had. We're not quite sure, but DPR basically said uh, no more use of dry ice. And in fact, Bell Labs has uh, has purchased the rights to or has the rights to that product, and they sell it, but it's just not distributed here. So. Even though it's, there's a label and it's legal in California now, it's just not available. It, you can't actually get it because there's no distributors of dry ice. It's just a complicated issue. So you can't go buy yourself dry ice, shove it in, and seal it? That's so that the way the regulation works is you have to have a label, a legal, uh, legal binding document associated with the label in order to use any sort of pest control in a professional manner. So because that's not the case, uh, we can't use just dry it. We can't just use whatever products that work. They have to be labeled um, through the California uh, Department of Pest Regulation. It's a maddening bureaucratic problem that we've been trying to struggle with for years. So we have temporary permission to use uh, dry it, but we had to actually contest that. Red, red, we had a label so that we could use it legally as what they call an exempt product. Um, but uh, I think because, uh, well, for reasons that I'm not fully sure about, uh, EPA issued an edict saying we can't do that. And then, uh, then the, the Bell product came out, uh, but like you said, it's not available here yet. It's available in a few places back east. Chris, who's included in the weed? In the That's what I was going In the weed for? In the weed, we. As we can't use dry ice. Who's yeah. weed? Uh, anyone who's doing pest control professionally. So a private resident can. In the state of California? Yes. Technically a private resident can't either. It's illegal in the state of California to use any method to kill any animal that isn't approved by DPR. So according to DPR, DPR contradicted that. So something that would qualify as an exempt product, that a private resident could go and use it on their own property, but we can't as professionals. But they have to have that exempt. You know, so like if you maybe, were, yeah, maybe like for ants, right? right? You want to, yeah. you go in and you use bleach to kill ants. That is technically a violation of the label and whatnot. Yeah. It's not an approved method. Yes. Now you can kill all the ants and then yeah. come in and wipe everything down with bleach, and then you're legal. But you yeah. just can't pour the bleach on the ants. I believe that they they said they gave that opinion based on the fact that it was exempt materials. There was CO two, which is on the list of materials that don't need to be registered aside. So that was what they told me, that a private resident could use dry ice, maybe not bleach. Um, although people do that sort of thing for us all the time. So yeah, it's it's a bureaucratic, it's silly bureaucratic stuff. We're still so currently push Bell, Bell Labs to distribute it here, but 
it's not listening. So currently, the, the, our choice, our method is using the CO machine. It's really effective. It's got, um, it's got a place where you can put, um, it's basically attached to the manifold. You can put mineral oil, proprietary stuff that actually get, gets off the smoke. Um, so you can kind of trace where these burrows are coming out and you can seal them up. And after several return visits, the, the number of burrows go down, activity goes down. The issue is there's always new populations that are constantly trying to move in. So it's a constant, that's where the monitoring is most important because you have to go back and make sure that you're on top of, um, on top of it. Um, there are situations where we can't use that machine, where we're up against buildings, where they, we don't know if they have basements or void spaces. So we have to be careful when, when using that and be, be um, conscious of that as well. Which machine? The CO machine is called a, it's called a uh, Burrow X or Burrow RX. Um, and another name is uh, Gopher X. It's generally used for gopher control, but um, I think it works better with rats as far as what we can tell so far. Mm -hmm. You can use it on any dirt on the so according to this, there, it's not, it's, it's a device. So according, this is again, going back to the direction, you can use it um, as long as, you, uh, there's, no, there's no restrictions as far as, it's not, it's not considered a pesticide, it's considered a pest control device, which is a different uh, set of rules. So and that, that's. Um, so the device, even though it's the CO2 that's doing the actual. Yeah, CO. CO, CO that's yeah. doing the actual. Cool. Yeah. But that's that's the way it is now. That could change. Um, that was um, updated, I think, in 2012 when they, when they updated that information. What are you using with your tolerance for being around buildings? How far are you using the same as the uh, aluminum uh, 100 feet rule that they used for aluminum? Uh, uh, it depends on if it's occupied or not. If it's in a non occupied building. Um, you know, we'll check. It is have, does it give off smoke, so we would visually be able to see whether it is entering. Um, so we're just conscious of that. And, um, you know, if we don't know, if we don't have access to the building, then we won't use it near a building. So it's at least like 50 to 100 feet away. You know. What do you do with the body and the trap? And the trap? The when body of the rat. Oh, when we trap trap. rats? Yeah, we just We wrap them up and throw them in the trash. Um, that's the recommended way to get rid of them. Do you get overtime for working at night? Or? <laughs> <laughs> or I'm, I'm not salary. <laughs> <laughs> do, you take, do you take any of those rat carcasses and do analysis for flea? No, absolutely not. No, that's, uh, that would be more time consuming. I mean, I guess we could if we had more. Thank you. More personnel to do that, but that's that's the that's, other. that's more of a DPH thing. We don't have the resources. My boss won't get upset if I was to bring those rats to my desk since <laughs> I don't have a lab. You know, yeah, well, for fleas. Go to a lab, I think. These yeah, days, I would think. Yeah, I would think so. That, but there are there are uh, certain diseases like typhus that rats could be carrying. I don't know about plague these days, but we had a presentation Absolutely. a couple months ago on that subject. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, but we don't have a. Uh, a vector agency like the other adjacent jurisdictions around the Bay Area. Like Alameda County, like any other county except San Francisco. I won't ask why. I was also going to mention uh, matters, I don't know if you're going to mention the fact that we did consult with um, him as far as whether they're coming from the sewer or are they just coming from the surface level. So that is consider of the consideration by Portsmouth, for example. Yeah, like I was going to point that out as uh, the different uh, entities working together. So when uh, I uh, uh, was looking into what Reckon Park was doing in Chinatown around Portsmouth Square, in around um, October of 2016, I uh, reviewed the um, test, uh, the, the rat treatment, the, the sewer treatment records that uh, Luis's company generates uh, and found that uh, there is very little uh, activity in the sewers in that area and absolutely no activity, according to these records, in the streets adjacent to Portsmouth Square. Uh, and uh, so that indicated that the, um, that the infestation is uh, mainly concentrated in the, uh, in the areas above the sewer system 
you know, like if you if you can imagine Portsmouth, where there's some dirt areas surrounding that are riddled with rat burrows, uh, and that kind of indicated that uh, there is no breach, uh, or th they're not they're not using a breach uh, in the in the sewer where they're coming up through the sewer, or burrowing through those areas and surfacing. It's mainly contained. Uh, we we think it's mainly contained in those areas. What do you think the food source is? Uh, there's there's a lot of restaurants nearby. There, we've been out there at night trapping. We've noticed people just putting trashes trash outside in the alleyways and whatnot. And that was another reason we worked with uh, Public Works. And they, and as far as uh, uh, we went out in Willy Woo Woo, we went uh, in those alleys to uh, and actually cited some uh, some places, and as well as uh, um, uh, Public Works looked looked at. Um, who had trash service? A lot of these restaurants didn't even have trash service. Um, so that was a big issue. And not necessarily just the restaurants, if I can inject this. Yeah. It's, uh, also, the housing uh, may be overcrowded, and uh, the number of people uh, in the housing um, overwhelms the garbage uh, accommodations. So uh, it's most more likely that um, uh, things get dumped out into the street as well. Yeah. Do, you, do you think? Uh, the digging of the subway contributed in any way to or the fact that of course it's like over a garage. Well, anytime anytime there's construction and there's movement of dirt, the roads will move in different areas. And a good example of Washington Square, um, we're doing construction the construction's just started and they just put up the fence, but what we did is <coughs> before they actually started construction mobilization, they put the fence up and we were able to go in five days prior and trap and check traps every day. And the, and the numbers started at, at 20, 10, 5, and then until they dwindled down to, to uh, zero. And then, then they moved in and started construction. So that the local neighborhood is not going to be impacted by displacement of uh, I If I can uh, say something, yep. is uh, the, uh, we, we were out there concurrently taking a look at the area, and we saw the fenced off uh, area uh, where the uh, excavation was occurring for the central subway uh, project. Uh, we also saw the, you know, those big steel plates that go over the excavation when they're done, okay? Uh, the rats had chewed around the perimeter of those plates mm. through the asphalt, through the blacktop that they are putting there. Uh, so they were coming up from the excavation. In uh, 2013, um, I had been contacted by the MTA regarding the subway project and uh, asked what our criteria is for a vector mitigation plan. And I told them basically that we have no criteria, but I'll take a look at whatever they, uh, they, they, they put together. And, and if it's good, I'll endorse it. And I did review it, and I found that they, came, they put together a really comprehensive plan on not just addressing rats, but mosquitoes, flies, uh, small animals like raccoons, so on and so forth. They just went through the whole thing. Uh, and I believe um, uh, Pestec might have, uh, or I think Pestec did author that. Uh, that plan, but come to actually do it, just went dead. <laughs> okay. So, can I can I speak to that? Their contract said that they had to create a vector control plan for the construction, but that they didn't have to implement the plan. So, <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> so that was the oversight in the contract. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, never mind that. Okay. So they on that. Um, one thing you mentioned that was about burrowing underneath the buildings, and I guess this question is kind of for anyone in the room to answer. What do you guys do when, when they're burrowing under a building? Like, not in the crawl space, but literally you see that they're you know, burrowing under the concrete of, of the building. Like, there's some type of sandy material or something, and they're able to burrow under the building. Well, it's the same. It's the same thing. You can either exclude them, like with the excluder material that was presented, or steel mesh. Um, you can, you, you can, especially when they're trying to go towards the edge of the building. You can um, bring it out like a foot or so, and they'll they'll dig, but they'll, they'll lose interest a lot of times. Um, that's one tactic. Um, and if the building's not occupied, you could do do like a seal seal treatment. Um, there are baits. You can bait burrows. We don't do that because we don't want to take the risk of baits being expelled into the, back into the parks system, so. Um, yeah, if it gets to that point, uh, it can be reported to me, and 
And as long as there is evidence of actual activity, uh, a lot of times I would refer that to uh, PESTEC to gravitate their, um, their, their service in that area, uh, you know. To I'm talking about probably like a private property. You know, as a private, are we gonna ask, you know, homeowner to put mesh in their whole front yard? Like say, if the rodents are burrowing, like going from, they have tunnels that go from the front to the backyard. Are we going to ask them to put mesh, you know, mesh on the whole I, front yard and the whole backyard? I, I have the impression what your question was, was uh, what, what do you do if they're burrowing into the building? Okay. Is, is that what it was? Is that underneath the foundation? Oh, like underneath the building. Underneath. But not building. into the building. Not into the building. I see, okay. Underneath. It's always good to have a clearance, too, from the building. A lot of times the vegetation's a big deal, and thinning out vegetation's away from the building and like two, three feet out, and you can put like a harder surface, like a, like, um, like DG or some kind of uh, hard packed uh, gravel, um, where it's not easy for them to dig. Cause they like to go to the, they like to go to the edge of some kind of structure cause they want to have that roof. So if they, you're digging and they come out two, three feet, then they're not going to continue to dig necessarily. So it'll at least move them away from the building three feet, then you can even treat those burrows too as well. Thank you. I think the common practice for contractors is to set up a bait box next to it and then feed the rats forever uh, and hope that you kill the rats that are going in. I think a better treatment would be to directly treat the burrow. So we do have a dye track uh, tracking powder, which is a first generation anticoagulant that you can directly treat into a burrow and leave the burrow open to let them come in and out. And then they get it on themselves and groom and that's how they ingest it. Uh, or you would need a second generation or a non-anticoagulant um, pellet to treat them there. But there is some risk with that and it would take some monitoring uh, by the applicator. But I feel like that's a standard that really just has to be discussed and you know, maybe even captured in the pesticide, reduced risk pesticide with specific directions. For those burrows. And are you adding any um, burrow rodenticides to the list this year? So the draft, according to the work group meeting that we had, there was a request to allow non-block second gen uh, products, that has not products. So First now, gen. so in other words, formulations that are not blocks. Right. So that's in there on the draft, and there are some restrictions written in too. And I, and I actually meant to say that the, uh, the draft, the new draft list is ready and will be distributed this week to you all. Um, cool. And you know, there's kind of an extended time there will be public comment on that, uh, written public comment, we hope. But it's also a chance we can we can tweak it okay. to make sure we got it right. Um, that's a tough issue, you know, yeah. uh, and uh, it, it might be one of those things that we don't want to allow in, in parks for, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe in more urbanized setting where there's dense urban areas where you have this kind of situation. Exposed. Yeah. Um, geo mesh on a person's yard would be really expensive, I'm sure. And it's you really would still expensive. need to abate the rats that are there. I mean, you always want to start with well, treating what's there. Well, get rid of the, get rid yeah. of any sanitary conditions that are attracting them. And, and actually, we have um, we have a set of guidelines on preventing pests in landscapes that will address some of that. That can be a resource also. Uh, are you here with the pH? Uh, does the Department of Health have the power to compel a uh, private property owner to undertake abatement procedure? Yes, absolutely. Uh, under the sections that I pointed out earlier and also under what's called Article 11 of the uh, San Francisco Health Code that addresses public health nuisances, which mainly covers vector issues. Or, or would, it, would that be the likelier way or would they um, be required to allow uh, a public entity or contractor to come onto their property that you're taking paper. How do you usually well, proceed with that? Well that would be uh, that that would be one of the um, one of the directives. I mean we first we would go out and investigate the situation and when we do uh, we take note of any contributing factors uh, you know be it exclusion, food sources, uh, you know and, and, and other things that need to be addressed to uh, to deter the rats and on top of that uh, you know, if uh, necessary, we would require them to hire a professional pest control company 
Um, you know, so it's not only that we want them to get rid of the rats, we would want them to get rid of any reason or contributing factors of why the rats would want to be there in the first place, and that would be noted on the notice of violation. Sure, all the contributing factors as well as treatment of the boroughs themselves. Absolutely, treatment of the boroughs. We could follow up with uh, referring it to PESPEC for treatment of the sewers if necessary, and also surface, surface treatment if, uh, if necessary. Has that, been, uh, has that been exercised, that power of an exercise? Absolutely. Probably? We do that regularly. Yeah. Great. That's the only recourse. Huh? Is there a mechanism to have uh, your contractor us treat and then charge back the property for those services? Uh, so it doesn't come out of the city-wide budget for... Whether it's you or another contractor, right. that's, that's up to the property owner. We leave that up to them. Who to, who to pick to do this, as long as it gets done. And uh, by the way, sir, if we issue an NOV, it's not the end of the world. It's just us notifying them. It's a notice, yeah. okay? Now, uh, we'll work with them in, uh, in, with, uh, uh, yeah, in doing the corrections, but if they really don't come through when they should, we could bump it up uh, as an enforcement agency. Get a place to lean against the property, against, uh, if, against if, the title. Yeah, if we um, if we charge reinspection fees that they don't pay, we we could or fines, uh, we clean the property if it gets to that point. But it, it typically doesn't. Other questions for Matt? How many rats are in San Francisco? A lot. We had we had an assistant director that said for each person there's a rat. But uh, it's, um, who knows if it's more or less, depending on, well, we, we, we endeavor to make it less. <laughs> yes. how, how many notices of violation does the uh, Department of Health issue for rats a year? Oh, that's, uh, I, I, can't, I can't say because um, those notices of violations, uh, you know, are also for bed bugs and, um, and uh, you know, other type of vermin. Uh, so maybe a better question, if you were to, if you wanted to obtain that information from the Department of Public Health, is how many rat complaints we get uh, every year, uh, and uh, you know we, we can uh, dial up those figures uh, upon request, but I don't I don't know them offhand. Hey, we still have uh, one more section, uh, Matt. We have another good reason not to go into closed parks at night. <laughs> Perhaps waiting for you. But, uh, thanks. Let's get so I think Luis, you're in. So, hi, I'm Luis with Pestec. So, um, this is a photo of our field trip that we took uh, with DPH, DPW, American Park uh, in April of last year. Uh, this was driven partly by uh, DPW. Uh, they were working on um, cleaning up Chinatown and, and uh, doing some, some, um, some repairs and maintenance in Spofford Alley was one of the, uh, the locations. And uh, they asked us for help. How, do we, uh, how can we help control some of the rat problem? And we knew that uh, the contributor for rats in Chinatown are, are dumpster areas or uh, waste bins. Uh, dumping that was happening, and also all the nooks and crannies that are in between buildings that rats are able to pass in and out of. So on our field trip, we documented much of that. Uh, Natter did uh, present some uh, notices to the uh, uh, property owners, and, uh, and we worked with uh, um, Reckon Park to abate some real estate that the rats had moved into. And this was a little strip of uh, land on the back side of a, um, a tennis ball court. If you go to the next slide, you can see that. I just wanted to mention real quick, and uh, let's give credit to the food program of the Department of Public Health that worked with the eateries around the area. Oh, working with those restaurants as with well. The restaurants were markets. Mm -hmm. So you can see that it really does take a, a big collaborative effort to be able to reach all the stakeholders to address this in a uh, preventative way. Typically, and as Natter kind of alluded to earlier, pest management is something that's driven by crisis and complaint. And uh, so it's my hope that these kinds of conversations that we're having right now, we can take those crises and what we learned in the past and start doing some prevention up front. So for me, this is a success story. We were able to identify a big source of population or where the, the rats were living. 
uh, Reckon Park had us abate the problem. We used uh, giant gas destroyers in this case. And even though it, this seems like it's up against the building, this is like a cutoff area down there. So we, we watched it and, uh, and it didn't uh, pose any kind of problem. We installed uh, the concrete there and, uh, and I think that we abated that specific source of rat problem for a period of time. Now Willy Woo Woo Wong is under, uh, playground is under construction. So they've completely gutted this entire playground except for this tennis court. And uh, there are some uh, trailers that are there. I went by yesterday to take a picture. I did see an uh, immature rat kind of running around here. And it was coming from this corner between two different, dif uh, two different buildings. So uh, the job isn't done. There is still a source of rats in between these Sorry, properties. Um, but at least they're not growing on Wreck It Park's property anymore. <laughs> so I feel pretty good about that. Um, so next slide, another example. Oh, this is yesterday. This is the construction trailers that are there and the concrete's still in place and there aren't any burrows. So uh, that's one way of sealing our rats is put concrete there. Uh, next one, oh, that's the construction site as it is. And all the cars are parked up on the uh, tennis court over there. So, and, and that goes to another thing that we learned. So uh, and that was an instance of us abating a problem before construction had occurred. And uh, I think that's something that we should be really happy with. I think what's missing now is the construction site needs to have an ongoing uh, management plan. And that's something we could probably address uh, uh, systematically by putting it in contracts or in the plans for those new uh, capital improvement projects. Uh, this is an example at uh, West Portal, uh, parking lot in West Portal. This is an SFMTA location. Uh, the <coughs> sides of the parking lot uh, have this uh, landscaped area with the ivy. The ivy was totally overgrown. It's really hard to see, even with this picture up close, of the rat burrows. But you can imagine that there were, you know, I would say over 100 burrows uh, on this wall alone, and uh, probably including other areas. So uh, we did something very similar to what uh, Nikki did at UN Plaza. We uh, removed the weeds, we dug out some of this area, and instead of the geo cloth, we used the screen, a stainless steel hardware cloth, uh, and then we put DG on top of it. So uh, with that, I think that we left the place better than we found it, and we got rid of the rats. So I'm, I feel pretty, uh, pretty happy about that as well. Who is you say you got rid of the rats, so did you do something before the yeah. queen? So you you, you really abated the rats before yes. excavating. And exactly. Otherwise, they would just run away, right? Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, we were going to chase them maybe into the pizza place next <clears> door. <throat> um, yeah, so, uh, so we did some trapping at nighttime. Uh, for the back fence area, we used the giant gas destroyers. For these big openings that are in this concrete slab that probably go into that restaurant, uh, we did treat this with a redenticide and uh, traps. Uh, just, just for the record, uh, sorry, uh, we did have the food inspector go into the Goat Hill Pizza and uh, no rats, there is no back door or anything, the, um, and uh, it, it, it's pretty much, uh, 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 it did not have rats at the time of those visits. Okay, so great. And we were in conversation about this, that that was a potential, and uh, yes. so you ruled it we, out. We, we, had, we had them go over there and check it out. Okay, yeah. fantastic. So, um, the Algerian ivy there is probably one of the most pernicious uh, exotic species grown as a landscape plant in the coast of California, easily on the top 10. Um, how deep did you dig down to remove the roots? Yeah, I had a feeling this was going to come up. And I wanted to ask, how do we deal with the roots that are in between these concrete slabs? Because I think constant, the part of this mitigation plan is going to require returns to the site to continue to remove or heaven forbid, the tree, the foliage is inevitably going to sprout from a, even a one inch piece of stem or root that was left behind. Yeah, I think you're right. And it could destroy everything that we did install just, there, right? Just and open turn your back on it and it'll yeah. be like, like that in a couple of years. So, uh, so I can, I'm going to need some help from the group here then on how can we address that or how can SFMTA address that? Because in the end, their, their landscape is a lot Stop selling it in nurseries. <laughs> <laughs> this has been there for years, I'm sure. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> Um, is that an old sprinkler head um, on the right? Yeah, there. Well, there's there's pipe that goes all the way around this. Okay, so when you're, have you had to deal with irrigation in, in addition to kind of dealing with these strips and having like 
have have you had irrigation as part of this kind of layer cake you guys are building? No. In this okay. instance, all we did was remove what was there and uh, install the DG on top of it. Okay. So, do you anticipate that might come up? Um, I'm sure. Okay. Has anyone? You know, one of these kind of Okay. Yeah, I think they're going to have to go back and remove it because because now there shouldn't be anything growing there right. uh, the way you left it. You can have you can like exactly you can just cut around and have the pipes go above and still irrigate the grass above the. Twenty fourth New York, we cut around the irrigation. Yeah, us too. We've just found that it adds one extra layer. Oh, of, yeah. You know, as we're doing maintenance and stuff, it's just something that we've always been thinking about. But you can plant on top of that, so yeah. you, know, you can plant grass or shrubbery or whatever after you put the barrier down. So you don't not necessarily have to use DG. Not with heavy canariensis, you can't. You can't walk away from that plant. If you keep watering it, that's what's coming back. There's nothing else that you're going to just plant over the top and make it disappear. Oh, I wasn't. Yeah. That's heavy canariensis. Oh, yeah, I wasn't. Sorry. I, I mean, you can't have irrigation continually there not have that. That's right. Yeah, we're not worried about it. In general. Yeah, we're just talking generally, like, just as we're just, as that's getting designed. And I think that really the service here would that falls to the landscapers, whoever is redesigning this place. This was kind of a pilot for us to see can we uh, can we leave it better off than the way we found it? We keep rats from continuing to go in there. Sure. So next slide. So um, so that's an outdoor setting on road and control, uh, but the you know neighborhoods are also impacted by what's happening uh, construction. We talked about and it's kind of anecdotal that when we start stirring up the street or we're, we're, we're leveling a, a, a building, that we flush the rodents from those buildings into our spaces. Uh, in City Hall, we've been having a, a lot of uh, mouse calls this year, a big spike in mouse calls. Uh, earlier this year, uh, they ripped up South Beth Venice for a new bus lane. So it's not just in City Hall, it's uh, in Civic Center, we've been seeing an increase in mouse calls. So uh, we knew that this was coming, we had talked about it, we knew that uh, we were gonna have to do some prevention. Uh, and, you know, things don't really, people aren't moved until it becomes an issue. So uh, after we started getting mouse calls, we, uh, we did get the okay to go back and fix some screens that uh, over time had been reopened up and where mice were getting in, uh, to install some door sweeps. And uh, now we're working with facility staff as they're remodeling building, uh, uh, office spaces and changing carpets to, uh, to really seal up uh, mouse openings that are on utilities or uh, under baseboards where we see mice are passing through. So that's another um, pest prevention practice uh, that we use uh, during the lifespan of a building. Uh, yeah, I was also going to mention, I know that you're uh, limited to City Hall, but just to let you know, other buildings around that area, uh, namely our building, Fox Plaza, I'm embarrassed to say that the health department uh, has a mouse problem now that we're trying to deal with. Uh, and also the, uh, the courthouse on 400 McAllister. Now the, uh, the, the problem there with addressing the, the, uh, that situation is you know those, uh, if you've ever been to the courthouse, uh, the, the front doors, you've got these big heavy doors uh, that are regarded as um, uh, historical, it's a historical structure, so they are avoiding to do rodent grouping there because of that reason. Uh, you know, and I just wanted to point that out as a, a uh, a factor that we would probably need to consider when we're addressing these things with other agencies. Yeah, yeah and even when they're willing to change the doors, sometimes it's hard to fix those doors anyway because they're all glass or they're heavy steel on the bottom and there is really no good solution for uh, pest proof. Uh, we came up with some solutions, but not durable because they can't really be fixed to the door. It's glued on. Right. Yeah. Yes. So uh, that's ba those are the three examples that I uh, that I brought for us to talk about. Any more questions before you walk? <laughs> Do you use a wildlife camera? Like, when nobody's there, can you track a rodent or the activity of the rodent? Like, I had a wildlife camera. I live in, in uh, Sonora. I had 200 flashes in one night in one red, in one crawl space, and I didn't know until I actually got the camera to record it when I was not awake. Right. 
Yeah, we do find that to be helpful, uh, in particular for roof rats. Uh, yeah, in San Francisco, we've been having more roof rat issues and tropical rat mite problems associated with the roof rat. And uh, trying to find uh, rats in a, you know, how they get into a building from the roof line can be very tricky. Uh, and actually finding them in attic spaces that are finished, so they have drywall in the attic spaces, you're not really sure yes. what uh, bay it's in. Uh, that's been something helpful for us. Installing those uh, cameras on the outside. Well, so we did that here at CFB. We had cameras, we had roof rats, and sometimes it's easy to figure out where they're coming from and you kind of follow it. The next day you kind of move the camera and you kind of figure out, oh, it's coming from this direction. Let's, let's, you know, then you kind of find out where the hole is, where the void space is. And the it's very helpful. And there is there's actually uh, technology making the rounds now that's <coughs> more. <coughs> about uh, remote sensors, like automatically sensing uh, rodents, basically have something like a bait box, they go in it, it trips uh, a, a signal on the internet, uh, internet of things kind of set up. So automatic monitoring, uh, promoted by some very big companies that we usually don't do that much business with. But, um, <laughs> they're trying to, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting idea and uh, I'm, you know, I'm curious where it's going to go. Um, you know, we're in the testing phase right now in uh, ca uh, the Academy of Science. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're using a, a mouse trap that has a sensor on it and sends you a text message when, uh, when, it's, uh, trapped. Uh, okay. when it's triggered. Uh -huh. Exactly. But there's all, you know, it's, it's new technology yeah. and it's a little clunky and you have to get onto the Wi Fi network or you have to provide a hotspot. And so uh, I think there's different versions coming out with different, different tech. And I think one of the problems they cited was. You know, there has to be internet. Yeah. Right. And so they have, also, you buy this product, you also have to buy these little boxes to make sure there's internet everywhere you're putting the, the sensors. Isn't that good? Oh my gosh. Luis, how does uh, station boxes work? Uh, because we have a bunch of boxes around the area we have, and uh, we don't know how often they are checked. Or... Uh, base station boxes? Yeah. I mean, they're typically checked on a monthly basis. Uh, if it's uh, bait and if it's traps, it, it should be more frequent. Um, we try not to leave a trapping station unattended for more than a week. Otherwise, then we're dealing with the, uh, a maggot riddled carcass and it smells and becomes less attractive for other rats. That's where this IoT trap would be really helpful. Yeah. You could have yeah. trapping stations and only check the ones that need to be serviced. We have uh, problems in the city in various areas where uh, people like the rats and they feed them and uh, we, we've had problems with them going into uh, bait boxes and replacing the rodenticide with cat food. Oh brother. Yes. Or feeding the pigeons, they're actually thinking they're feeding pigeons because they're actually feeding rats. Yeah, that, that too, or feeding their pets, their dogs, you know, by uh, walking down the street and throwing kibble on the ground and, you know, a dog does need everything. Is, is the infamous blue pickups still making the rounds with feeding pigeons or is a blue pickup truck and guy who would go around every day throwing out bird seed? I don't know if you've seen. Oh, yeah. Because you know, the bird like feed, that. you know, in the night or the bird stealth, you know, see piles of seed. Yeah. Or you have a bread. Stale bread. Okay. That's super common. I mean, people any square, them. many parts, yeah. same people that live nearby every day go out there and dump their old bread and rice and everything else. Anyone who's ever watched Mary Poppins? <laughs> <laughs> birds. Okay, well, let's give, give a voice to him. Okay, so uh, considerations for improvements. Uh, so where do we go from here? Um, I, uh, you know, we could probably all chime in on this, but as far as uh, Department of Public Health is concerned, um, we have a contract, or uh, actually the PUC has a contract uh, with uh, Pestec, which we manage, and that contract is for $100,000 a year uh, for Chinatown and also another $100,000 a year for the rest of the uh, city. And that contract's been uh, going on for, uh, what, since uh, the uh, 2000? Yeah. Okay. Uh, probably be put in, we probably should be putting more money into that. Uh, also, uh, prior to, we, we've talked about uh, heat mapping and concentrating our efforts where the uh, more of uh, activity is noted uh, in the city uh, using heat map technology. 
And even prior to that, I was talking to somebody from the San Mateo County uh, Vector Control Agency that really um, uh, advocated that. So we may be uh, going in that direction as well. We, uh, as an extension of um, the uh, San Francisco Health Code, Article 11, the Nuisance Code, we have our uh, director's rules on vector control that are uh, a bit archaic. And uh, in my upgrade of those rules, I'll be including uh, sections on um, demolition, excavation, uh, and construction. Uh, you know, so that um, you know the uh, the um, th those those issues can be uh, handled as well. Uh, so that would be bumped up to the um, uh, health department management, which would be dealing with the management of those entities uh, involved. Um, the, yes. So it, you mean it'd be a requirement to do more? Yes. To do abatement during those periods? Yes. yes. Would you specify the type of uh, abatement or requirements? Uh, we, uh, we, we, uh, uh, to a certain extent, yes. Uh, we would like to see pre-baiting uh, or, or baiting before the, uh, before the um, construction or demolition of about one to two months within about a thousand foot radius from the site. In okay. sewers? In sewers, yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, also maybe for um, uh, re remodeling or renovation uh, and I know that the city of Cupertino has this, and they're the only jurisdiction that I know that has this, uh, requiring uh, pest clearance uh, one to two months before they start uh, to avoid the migration of uh, mice or rodents uh, from, uh, from those areas as well. So a pest control company would either have to come in, clear the property of uh, rodent infestation, or treat any uh, um, existing rodent infestation to prevent the migration of those rodents during the remodeling. Uh, did uh, anybody else want to chime in on that? Uh, DPW, Pestec, uh, Rec and Park, as far as any uh, anything you have stored in the future? Ideas for improvement in general? Yes. What are the names of the key mapping technology that you're using in the software? You know, I'm I'm still living in the 70s, okay, and uh, uh, let's see, um, Can you repeat the question, sir? who would know that? Uh, he wants the name of the, uh, the entities or programs that would be doing the heat mapping. Uh, we, we do have a sector of environmental health that deals with that, uh, so we would be uh, asking them to do the uh, heat mapping. Uh, and I believe uh, you, you're uh, working on something along those lines? Right. Yeah, so we actually convened a, like a rat task force um, maybe a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, is it time to reconvene that group and, uh, and follow up and see where we are on these different projects and issues? That I would have to run by Larry. Uh, he, he would be making the call on that. And, uh, uh, and also, we, you know, if, if we do, we probably have to involve that sector of environmental health that, that, that does that. Let me know if you want some help putting that together. I think it's a great idea. We had, so, I mean, this is putting together data that's already there, essentially it's linking it together and then, you know, making a heat map, let's so say, or, or a map, and or a map that uh, shows you the history of each spot, which you already have for mosquitoes, right? Right. Um, and, and we have now for manhole treatments, but yeah. what's missing is what's happening around those manholes and okay. treatments over here. Right. So that's where we'd like to pull in EPW data, and record park data, and mm -hmm. our other data for other Locations that we're care of. So what would it take to get that moving? What, what would be? Well, what's what are the missing elements? I would I would have to discuss that with Larry. He's involved in other uh, sectors of healthy housing. Of course, we have the uh, hotel program that and shelters that take a lot of time. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we it's just a matter of uh, scheduling it. Right. And resources. Yes. I have one. Uh, idea. So 311 doesn't really have a location for people to report pest problems. And uh, it, it doesn't? No. Or at least not we, something you can find or it's not logical to how you get to it. And so actually we looked recently at all the 311 reports we have to report for it. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a single one for, um, for pests. Uh, I think, uh, Robert, you're working with 311, right? And I, and I we, we do regularly get uh, 311 complaints for pests. We need to. 
Uh, every time you call 311, and if you mention PISC, it'll come to public health directly. Okay. Even though it might be in public works, uh, property, uh, right. Rankin Park, Munich, it'll come to us first, um, always. So then we have to send it back to the proper agency. You see, then that way it's easy for you guys to track it, but then when it comes to us, we're not able to track it as if it was coming directly to you from guys. 311. Even, even if you have the service number? Yeah, because our service our service order number system is different. There's mm -hmm. like there's about three or four different service yeah, order systems for the whole city. Mm -hmm. So some people get service orders, but there's no service order. The port doesn't get service orders. Mm -hmm. So there's there's all these different things. For each, so if the same service order could go through four different entities and the number would change every single time. So maybe there's a way to redraw the lines on where things go or organize how that what happens? Mm -hmm. I, I remember going into 311 once and uh, it, uh, it was, you know, for a, a pest complaint and it seemed like uh, you really needed to know where to look. Right, and, you know, exactly. You know, so that's probably something we could look into and talk to them about. It's a lot easier if you talk to someone on the other line instead of doing it on mine. Right. So that's why I tell people to call and talk to a human being. I know it's a lot easier to do it on, on your phone or online, but it's better to talk to another person on the other end of the line. Right. But the thing about doing it online sometimes, it's easier because you can take a picture of the location. Of the and a lot of times the photograph is not going to come through to us. I'll get half of it. And so I'm, not, I'm looking at the sky and I'm like, okay, so what am I supposed to look for here? So. Or I look at a tire of a car, but I'm like, well, it doesn't say anything about cars. Yeah. Something about rodents, and there's a picture of a, you know, it's 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 not working 100 percent the way that it's supposed to. Not yet, anyway. Listen, yeah. So this is going back to the pigeon feeding. Does anyone know about how to get signage, like how to get? to pay, put, put signs saying please do not feed the pigeons. I've seen them at Glen Park Park randomly. I didn't. I don't know how the police decided to put signage saying please do not feed pigeons, which is awesome. But I have areas that are like an island, you know, that's right by an elementary school that a person who I cannot catch, and I don't have any enforcement. I just want to catch a person and say, hey, can I give you an educational handout? Please do not feed the pigeons here, because this person is continuously feeding, and it'd be nice if we could just get a sign that said on on public property on that little island, please do not feed there. But I don't know how to get anyone you, you to, to get the signage, or do I have to complain you, to the police? You, you we, have problems, though, we have BART right across from the airport, mm -hmm. and a lot of people go there, look for bags, the BART stations, oh, wow. or the parking lot, all the pigeons that come over to the airport. So, it's the same thing with the signs. They didn't have the signs. We have them at the airport, but they're not over there. We actually had to go to the city of Millbrae and to the police station and get them together and get their sign shops too. And then just, you know, keep pounding them and telling them, look, we're not, you know, we're next to an airport. You can't even the barts. Mm -hmm. And but it took a lot. We had to do the bark and get all their head people and go to the police station, get them and then go to their sign shop and then they made signs and then they finally put it took forever. Uh, usually here in the city, <coughs> if you see signs put up. There is another entity aside from the police department that would probably put them up. Like Bart itself might uh, do that, or uh, I don't know if DPW. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, public work has signs as well. Yeah. For, so then, uh, for yeah, do not be signs. It depends on what the location is. Are you guys allowed to just put them up? It depends on who, who <laughs> whose asset it is. So if it's if it's uh, if it's a public work asset, then we put a sign up on the public works. That says do not be pigeons. How do I ask for who's the right person to yeah, contact? We can talk. We can talk offline. Okay. okay. Yes. I'm curious to know if it sounds, it sounds like a lot of the work on rats is being done on on Norway rats. Is do you also have a well no, for for roof rats? Um, we 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 uh, respond to it uh, on a complaint basis. 
and usually we um, uh, we would look. Uh, well, we, we we could survey the area for what it's worth, but you know the Norway. Uh, I mean the roof rat uh, range is pretty wi uh, pretty wide, uh, but we try to find um, uh, harborage points within the neighborhood, uh, namely overgrown vegetation or excessive material piled up in backyards or homes that are. Um, that, are, that may harbor the uh, infestation. I mean, uh, w when we walk through certain neighborhoods, sometimes uh, it'll hit us in the face where we see um, a house with uh, some gnawing on the garage door, rub marks, droppings around the house, then we look up into the window and we might even see some, uh, uh, some signs of activity there. And literally, uh, one of our investigators back there uh, literally seen a, a mouse crawling up a curtain in a, in a house, you know. Uh, remember that, sir? <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, we would survey the area, but again, when you're dealing with Norway rats, uh, it could be beyond the area that we survey, you know. I'm just wondering if it's more difficult, roof rats are more difficult because you generally will have to work with a homeowner or within a structure. Yes. Well, it's uh, a lot of homeowners are cooperative and a lot of homeowners are not cooperative. A lot of city agencies you can work with and a lot of city agencies you can't work with. You know. um, so it depends on the situation. Another question. Yes. So yesterday I was walking the parking structure at San Francisco State and just before I got there I found this nice big juicy rat lying on its back mm -hmm. dead in the middle of the lawn. And uh, that's what they're supposed to do, as far as I'm concerned. But the question we have, I think, is that we have a lot of hawks living on the campus and the mm -hmm. really substantial tree cover, Cooper's hawks and others. And uh, what's the what's the possibility that this could be a uh, uh, secondary, sec secondary poison? Secondary poison for the it, it, it may or may not. Some uh, rodenticides, and you'd know more about this, Chris, may uh, may have no effect on secondary uh, poisoning. Some would. As far as uh, the, treat the treatments on state property is concerned, uh, I don't know if uh, the city has jurisdiction over that or California Department of Public Health. Um, you know, so... Uh, the, the, the Department of Public Health treats the university as it were a private entity because it's administered by the trustees and they say whatever you guys want to do is fine. You make up your mind and they don't interfere. But in this particular regard, this is handled by a private contractor who does the bidding. And uh, the information about how that is done is not readily available. Uh, nonetheless, that contractor, if he's operating in, uh, well, if he's operating period within, uh, within the state, would have to comply with the DPR laws, right? Okay, and uh, yeah. But it, that would still, I mean, they're still allowed to use a second generation for mm -hmm. it Very well could be, I mean, was there bleeding? If you see a rat, I don't want to see it. Take a look. You know, because it's an attic way, a lot of the times you'll see bleeding in the mouth. Yeah, I, evidence, but I mean, the best practice would be, you know, pick them up and throw them away. Yeah, so a bird's not going to get it. I was off the really off the track. Track. It, was, it was after five o'clock. Okay. I stopped to take a picture because I'm going to have them to show it to our compliance officer and ask him to mm -hmm. run this one down because yeah. potential threats of wildlife. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, insects control, not for uh, worm control. Mm -hmm. So I'm not included in the process of how this is oh. dealt with on campus. That's so something. Boxes too. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's public information. Yeah, it's it should be. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That, that's the something that. Mm -hmm. Oh so well. If you see one the station, you can look. You as long as you can Google it. As long as they're all the same. That's, that's one of the hot spots of San Francisco State slash Park Merced uh, for rodents and also mosquitoes. You know, so the, uh, the investigators looking into that. However, we've met some challenges with the, um, uh, with the uh, people involved, uh, you know, uh, you know the, um, 
what, what, what did they call it, the, the reporting system that they have? Okay, uh, there is, uh, doesn't seem to be very effective. But, you mean um, lack of transparency? Well, uh, no, it's ju just that uh, they, well, uh, yeah, a little bit of that, uh, lack of transparency, and also um, uh, we, we're recommended that the complainants <coughs> should contact the uh, service line um, and uh, they claim that they don't. We, we've contacted the service line and, you know, uh, didn't get much of a response. The facility <coughs> services work control center? Uh, I believe that's what it was. Uh, so, um, you know, we're gonna start utilizing any means, be it th those, uh, those, uh, those service numbers and also uh, working together with uh, building and ground and uh, helping curb the, the problem yeah, because it's, it's going, uh, not that this is any reason for it. I mean, there shouldn't be a rodent problem at all, and uh, there shouldn't be the factors contributing to the rodent problem, but it is going from a, a state uh, entity to a city uh, entity, and you know, basically going back and forth, uh, like I said, between uh, Park Merced and uh, San Francisco State. In, in order for me to place a, a service request, I have to log into the university computer system, so someone who's not actually uh, uh, a member of that community isn't able to access their online you know, service requests. We, we make calls. Yeah, that's another way to go. Yeah. You know, it, it might be worth pointing out here that there is a bill, a state bill, 1788, uh, that uh, would ban all second generation anticoagulants in the state. Okay. Uh, and it's actually made progress. Have you been following that later? No, I haven't. It's, it, it may get passed. Mm -hmm. It may get passed. So okay. That, I mean, which will be a mixed blessing. But there would be um, exemptions to the, for, for the city. There are, there are exemptions for vector control mm -hmm. agencies. But uh, for private right now, um, probably, we're not sure, but probably most of those products are being used by professional contractors. Mm -hmm. And it's probably kind of a, a standard practice for many of them, the ones that aren't really paying attention, mm -hmm. some of them I should say. Um, but that would mean that, that would be good for wildlife. Um, it, it would be maybe a problem for resistance management in rodents. You have fewer products to rotate out. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Are you all following that bill, 1788? Uh, yeah, there's a chance of, of being passed at this point. So. I mm -hmm. wanted to say that there is a state program if you find dead birds of prey or dead animals that might have might have been impacted by rodenticide. There's a state program you can send those animals to yeah. and have them tested for rodenticide. And yeah. I'll say this year we found in the presidio three dead birds of prey. We're waiting on the results of two of them, but one of them, it was, it was determined that there was rodenticide. Yes, yeah. one thing to find a rat that does size of eye in the center of our turf area, or another thing to find a hog that was in the trees and in the forested areas where you can tell from the tree would be outside. If you all do find dead uh, birds of prey, uh, uh, I, have, I have a contact info. Uh, Stella McMillan is the person, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I can pass that on to anyone who needs it. Uh, they have to be reasonably fresh kills to be useful. Other questions or comments? A great conversation. Um, I have a question it's just about when Nikki was sharing about the, the DG and that sort of thing. What's the drainage on that? I mean, is it like the equivalent of just, I mean, in general? Because um, the concern of like, you know, opening up, you know, space for drainage. No. No, it drains pretty well. We use it all the time. So we use it in our tree basins for tripping hazards and things like that. Park and we have a track where they did taste rough and they basically compacted it to the level of the road and there is no drainage at all for it moves along the surface water. If, it, if it's raining lightly, misty, it's fine. But any sort of runoff that is created because it's on a 2% grade, it travels and it picks up the material because it doesn't have anywhere to go under. But I've used it in other situations where if, if it's just DG and you have soil underneath, it tends to drain fairly well. But it's all about the rate. Okay. 
Well, well, where's the closest that hantavirus has been found? The closest. Do you know that, Matt? No, I, I know that. Um, I believe uh, San Mateo and Alameda counties may be, uh, may be doing monitoring for that, but uh, I, don't, I don't know of any occurrences there. Uh, yes, Al? Hantavirus uh, <coughs> case. Uh, in the Bay Area was uh, 2014, 2013. It was in uh, Fremont. So this, was, this was during the time when they had the outbreak in Yosemite. Uh, yeah. the tent, there was this gentleman that unfortunately camped there and came down with hot fires. But it was brought in, not transmitted in Fremont. No, it was the whole, you know, he was infected at, uh, at uh, Yosemite. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So I well, think there's an additional slide. Oh, that's a cool. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>